And I just think there's something so cool about being a collegiate athlete. It's like a badge of honor we get to wear and kind of carry for the rest of our lives. Um, I always tell people, you know, like everything I needed to learn about life, I learned on a field somewhere. Um, and I just think that having that experience and getting to be a, a small part of helping a player get there, like I know in hindsight, like how to work on a team, how to overcome obstacles, like all those things that you take into the real world when your shelf life of soccer is over, stay with you forever. Um, and so, you know, we really, you know, all companies need to make money, but I, I will say like, we really come from a place of passion um, just based off of our own experience and wanting to get as many players the same opportunity that we had. Welcome, everyone. I'm Brady Larkin, and this is Footy with Friends. I'm a college soccer coach, a soccer fan, and a big advocate for folks doing great work to grow the game we love. Every week, I invite a guest on to discuss their expertise in the soccer world. I'm seeking to connect with innovative thinkers, leaders, and game changers at all levels of the sport. Footy, soccer, Football, no matter what you call it, it's a game that brings people together. I hope these conversations do just that and help to broaden our perspective and build appreciation for those that are putting in the work to grow the beautiful game. On today's episode, I get an inside look at Scouting Zone, the leader in the player recruitment industry. We welcome to the pod Scouting Zone Vice President and Co-Founder, Brooke Cantera. This was a fun conversation, and it became clear that Brooke and I both approach soccer with a passion and drive to help players have the same positive experiences we've had. She and her company are helping student athletes find the best fit for their collegiate experience, while I'm here on campus helping to mold those student athletes into young men that can go out and be leaders in society. In a way, we're both coaches, advocates, and educators. Brooke played college soccer herself and is a member of the University of Pacific Hall of Fame. We talk about how her love for soccer helped fuel the idea of Scouting Zone and provide the been there, done that experience that helps the company stand out from their competition. Scouting Zone is a service I've come to rely on as a college coach. I believe all coaches should be using this. And for players, it's the best way to connect with your dream school. In the crazy competitive landscape of youth soccer here in the U.S., Scouting Zone has proven to be a leader in helping to bridge the gap between youth and collegiate soccer. While other companies may have struggled for solutions during a pandemic, Scouting Zone made some strategic pivots to continue to educate players and grow their platform. And with that, let's get stuck in and turn it over to my conversation with Brooke Cantera. I know you said you're you're pretty busy and your schedule's packed. Like, have you been busy with more teams returning to play like what's it look like in california so california has obviously been later to the game as far as picking up play Mm -hmm. but in terms of scouting zone you know most of the country really opened up for soccer far sooner um, than california did so what we were looking at was a lot of events starting to pick back up towards the end of 2020. So that's when I really started to notice the influx of um, events that we were running. We're starting to, you know, get to go, you know, back to play. Um, and then of course, COVID presented the problem of how do we get, <clears throat> how do we continue to make the connections between college coaches um, and players during the pandemic, um, which has been interesting, but, you know, being that we are a technology company, COVID presented really some opportunity for us in that we are able to continue to allow players to connect 
to college coaches through events and through our platform in a mm-hmm. virtual setting. So as you know, recruiting has become very digitized right now. Oh yeah. So, you know, we're, we're busier than ever, which, you know, we didn't know going into the pandemic because we were very much an on-site recruiting model. Um, but because of our ability to pivot quickly to a virtual type space, I would say as a whole, the company really flourished um, through the pandemic and very grateful for that. Cause I know there's a lot of industries where that was not the case. Yes. Um, and of course, as play continues to pick up, we are extremely busy. So I think we're slotted to do over 70 events for scouting zone this year, which would be like major showcase events for the older age groups to be recruited and get to play for college coaches such as yourself. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. We're, we're all eager to be able to get out there and recruit in person. I mean, 2020, like you said, was the year of virtual recruiting. Um, and we've kind of had to adjust on our side too. Um, so it was kind of a, a learning process for, for everyone. Um, but we're glad there are services like scouting zone who, I mean, you guys just rolled with it. It seems, um, yeah, yeah, it's, it's been a really important part of what we do. So it's interesting back was, we started seven years ago and we, when we rolled out the app where college coaches could open it up at an event and see the player detail that you need, because aside from being a good player, you also need to know GPAs, grad years, and all that good stuff. We had the video capability built in, but because soccer is so objective and because there's such a need to be on site to recruit, I think more so yes. than even than other sports, because you really need to see what's happening off the ball, you know, what is the player doing to put themselves in good position? Um, it makes soccer unique in that way. So we really had no need to flip on the video component because everybody was showing up on the sidelines, which is exactly like you said, is where you want to be. To yeah. recruit. Um, when the pandemic hit, we were able to, because we had that built in functionality, flip on the video switch. So now college coaches like yourself, where there's a travel ban or D ones in a total deadlock mm-hmm. can from the comfort of their, you know, home or office, join the event, almost like they would see all of the information that they normally would on site. But then now we have the ability to upload full game footage. So I kind of call it like the second best thing to being on site is that you still can yeah. kind of do everything. And hopefully, you know, the video company did a good job and you're able to kind of assess players through the video that we're uploading. Man. Yeah. You guys, you made the pivot. I mean, that's a, that's, that's huge. Um, yeah. And, and again, fingers crossed, we get back to somewhat normal, but uh, we'll get there. Yeah. And then the other part of that was, you know, educating players through the pandemic. So, you know, you as college coaches, you still have a need to fill the roster spots. It's not like recruiting has stopped. Mm-hmm. It just changed. And so we had to really pivot also our communication um, and education to these players about, hey, don't stop communicating with college coaches. Don't stop sending your highlight videos and the footage of yourself um, just because you're thinking, well, there's nothing going on. So there's no need for me to be proactive in this process. So aside from pivoting our product itself, we also had to pivot the way that we were speaking to people because there was mass confusion on both sides, right? Everybody's trying to figure (laughs) out (laughs) from your perspective as a coach, you know, how do I effectively recruit during this pandemic? And then players thinking, well, there's no, I'm either not playing or there's, if I am playing, there's no coaches on the sidelines. Like what can I do? And most of the times the answer was kind of like, well, I'm not doing anything because I don't know what to do. So we felt really good about being able to get the message out there that you still can do things. And that, like I said, hope hasn't lost. Recruiting hasn't stopped. It's just changed for the time being. So it's nice to see things opening back up. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Yeah. And I I did see your company put out the four week recruiting plan, you know, something student athletes can do like with your guidance during the pandemic, like how to, how to send an effective email or cut a, a good looking highlight tape, like all those little, those little like nuances, like they go, those go a long way when they come across our desk as college coaches. So that was really interesting to see that something you don't see from a lot of bigger recruiting services, you know, that personal touch. 
100%. And I, I think one of the things that we found was lacking in the marketplace when it came to recruiting companies. And one of the big differentiators that we say that we have at Scouting Zone is, you know, we're not a, like a big bells and whistles type of company where you log in and you've got 500 different tools to, to sort through and try to f- kind of figure out the process. We mm-hmm. really take the information that we gather from you. So we ask the college coaches, okay, what's happening? What do you need right now? And then we translate that in messages to um, our database of over 150,000 players in the older age groups and say, this is what we've learned from the college coaches. And just to your point right now, when you're giving them the proper education about how do you write that email, what's going to look best to a college coach, um, you know, those are things that we're lacking, just to, just the education. Mm-hmm. And we, that's part of just the empowerment of these players and saying, you know, you work hard on the field, you work hard on in the classroom, and that there's no difference in working hard in your recruiting process. Um, right. Yeah. So, you know, you as a college coach, you don't want a canned email that looks like they sent it to a hundred other schools, right? Yeah. You you want it to be like, why does that player want to play for your program and that they're speaking directly to you and then talking about themselves in a way that positions themselves to make them look like a good candidate for your program. Mm -hmm. Those are just some of the small nuances, as you described, that we really try to convey to players so that, you know, they're not missing the opportunity or misrepresenting themselves by maybe sending what I would call a canned email just to get something off. Right. Right. It, like the sincerity goes right out the window. You know, we, it's hard to tell, like, are you genuinely interested? Like, are you, have you done your research? And sometimes it's easy to tell that the athlete hasn't or, or they have. Um, but like using your guidance, it seems like they're able to find a school that might be, a better fit. Yeah, absolutely. And that's the goal is we really believe that every student athlete can find a roster spot if they want it, if they're realistic about their level of play. I mean, there's so many Mm -hmm. opportunities out there. Um, Division one, division two, division three, NAIA, junior college is a great option. And I think that people are also uneducated about the opportunities out there. So you know, those are some of the things that we try to convey um, to ensure that they understand, like it's, you know, there's a lot of programs out there that can be great fits for you. And to kind of like, let's, let's expand your horizons a little bit here so that yes. you see the full scope of programs that are available to you. Um, because I think they think, well, here are my top five schools and I didn't get into one of those. So my career is over. And it, 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 you know, it doesn't have to be that way. It doesn't have to be exactly. Oh, if you want to play at the next level, you can get there. And that's kind of the message that we try to convey to these, these players. I love it. I love it. I'm here for that message. Yeah, for sure. (laughs) I know you are. Okay, folks, I want to take a moment to share with you my new blog, footyfriendsteam.com. If you're digging on the content from my guests, this blog is the perfect place to take a deeper dive into more material on leadership, teamwork, and innovative thinking. Some of it about soccer, some very loosely related, all of it from the heart. There will also be some exclusive content shared directly to the blog, including extended interviews. If you want to be the first to know about what guests are coming on, which games I'm looking forward to watching, and some of my other creative pursuits, sign up to join the footy friends team. This will also be the place to check out the Larkin on Liverpool segment for my reactions and takes on all things Liverpool. You'll also be able to find links to buy some of the books my guests have recommended. So you can start to build your own footy reading list. Again, that's footyfriendsteam.com. Now back to the pod. Maybe, maybe let's bring it back. Um, I know you mentioned seven years ago was the founding of scouting zone, but just over the past few seasons, you know, from a coach's perspective, it seems like every major showcase is partnered with scouting zone. So like, what's maybe the story of scouting zone? And can you tell me more about how this came to life? 
Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, quick background, my business partner and I, her name is Tara Parker. We founded the company seven years ago. We both played for San Diego Surf growing up, and then we played um, college at the Division One level together. And, you know, the way that we designed Scouting Zone was because we were connected to the game and so many of the coaches that we knew had been in the game for, you know, 20 years, about seven years ago, we invited 30 college coaches to dinner on us, drinks and all. And we okay. said, look, we have an idea. And our, if we put this out there, would you even use it? And our idea was Scouting Zone. And so we asked them, what are your pain points? What are some of the issues that you face like in your current recruiting process? Yeah. And we took notes and we got just an influx of information from these college coaches and then we thought, okay, at the end of the dinner, we're like, there's a clear need here. They just described to us exactly what they need. And then we built it. And I think the success of our company has really goes back to listening to the consumer and their needs and then mm -hmm. building a product instead of assuming what somebody might need and hoping that it works. So really scouting zone itself is a product of college coach feedback. And I think that's why we've stayed so successful. Um, when it comes to partnering with tournaments, once we get a college coach to use us, like us, they become our best salespeople. And again, they love it because they built it. You know, Tara and right. I didn't build it. Like you people like you built this product and continue to do so. We take feedback all the time and we think, wow, that's a great idea. It would benefit all of our users. And then we make the change across the board. So we get these college coaches that say, hey, are you at X event? And I'll say no, but is it important to you? And mm -hmm. if the answer is yes, I say, well, you know, why don't you send an email to that the tournament director, CC me on it. And when the event directors hear from the college coaches themselves, so it, it becomes less of me selling my product yeah. to the coaches who are actually using it, become our salespeople. And it's, it's hard to deny that if you're an event director and you're hearing from five to 10 different schools that this is who we use everywhere. Um, it almost is, I, I want to say, like an easy sale at that point because and it wasn't like that to start with. We really had to scrap and fight yeah. and, and try to make it, you know, educate people on how we were different. But once that we got over that hump fairly quickly, I, that's how we've captured. Um, I don't think Tara and I did anything brilliant other than listen. Um, and then, and I, I think that's a, a lost art. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, you know, when we explain, when we explain Scouting Zone and how it's been so successful and we say, well, we listen to our customer, the response is always like, wow, what a novel idea. Like <laughs> you actually listened and then delivered. Um, and we do the same for our players and any of the, the users in our database. So, you know, I can't even really give us a ton of credit on our success. It's just that we simply listen and then we build um, and we'll continue to do that. Yeah. So, sounds simple, but it's powerful. Right. And it is, it is simple. And, you know, there's a lot of overcomplication. I see a lot of our competitors that are in basketball, football, and they do a ton of different sports. Well, we're soccer people and mm -hmm. we understand the game. We understand the language, the dynamics. Um, and I think we stuck to what was true to our passion, um, what drives us, the sport that we love and gave us so much and didn't try to squeeze a basketball product into the soccer market. Um, there was a competitor that we faced pretty head on early um, and they were built for basketball. And it didn't take very long for coaches to say, well, this served a purpose a little bit, but we came in and we filled the entire soccer purpose simply because we are soccer people, if that makes sense. Yeah. So that was kind of the competition that we were up against. We're there. You can't really do that with soccer. You can't take no. a baseball product. And, and you know, you, I always use the term like for, for getting a scholarship, you know, in baseball, you can clock a fastball and maybe jump to the top of somebody's recruiting radar because you throw a hundred mile per hour fastball. Yeah. That doesn't happen in soccer. You know, in a 90 minute game, you might touch the ball for two minutes. So it just, it doesn't, it, it's a very different thing. So it we built it that way. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. So, you know, we both had prior to scouting zone, very comfortable pharmaceutical jobs. Okay. And we both have children and, 
you know, the, I think that's, you know, most people go after the pharmaceutical job. It's a great mom job, to be honest with you, but we mm -hmm. were more years. <laughs> and, you know, we just really wanted to get back to the sport that we loved. And, you know, like I said, it really all started with that night that we invited those college coaches out, got the answers yes. we needed and said, and we never looked back. We never, we quit our jobs the next day and said, let's go for it. So wow. that's inspiring. Wow. <laughs> Thank you. So, so what were some of the biggest talking points, you know, of the feedback from the coaches that, you know, they needed to see this in a recruiting service? I will say that number one was ease of use. So mm. like the, the number one thing we heard was if we need a three day tutorial to figure this out, we're never going to use it. And, you know, soccer coaches, they get into a rhythm, they get very good with their process. And I dare I say, get a little stubborn about it. Um, yeah. so what we had to overcome early on was just give us a, a chance, try us at this event and see if it doesn't make your life easier. Um, and once they dabbled in it a little bit, because I will tell you, I almost cried after our first event. I mean, it, we, we launched at surf cup, which back then, and I'll get into this in a second because leagues have really taken over. I think largely is one of the biggest changes I've seen since we started scouting zone is league domination mm. versus the independently run club events, which are still I can see that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we launched at surf cup and people were furious. I mean, college coaches were so pissed that there weren't being uh, printed profile booklets out and if they didn't read the email, they thought, where are my booklets? And you're telling me I have to learn a technology? That would and be me. That would be me. Be you, right? I'm the guy. I need my pen and paper. It, yes. it was a big transition. It totally was. And oh my gosh. And I, I remember that night thinking, I did we make a mistake? Like, I don't know if we're going to, like, nobody wanted to use our product. Hmm. Uh, they wanted their pen and paper. What we did off of that feedback was we did a hybrid model where you can actually still print from our system. So we finally started to get people like trying it. And then we said, okay, you can set your schedule and print it. We know you need your pen and paper. You know, you can print out the list of kids that you're looking out. So there still is sort of a pen and paper piece of or component to this that we allow mm -hmm. kids to use because, um, you know, you guys have been doing this things a certain way and it feels, you can tell me, it probably felt like overnight it was profile booklets for like the last 20 years. And then overnight it felt like those are gone. Boom. Everybody's going to the digital world. Yes. And for coaches who have their process down pretty good, such as yourself, it's like, what do you mean? Like, this is what I needed before. I still need it now. And why do I need a technology for this? Like, I already know what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. uh, so those were some of the hurdles that we had to overcome but again, going back to, I remember one of our first calls was from, I won't name him out, but he's total old school. And he called Tara and I on Thanksgiving because that was one of the surf cup events. You know, okay. we got into our home club. That was our first big win. Surf cup has usually been a pretty big event historically. For sure. And he, he called us and he said, I want to let you know that I'm drinking a glass of wine with my wife for the first Thanksgiving in that I could ever remember because normally on that night he would be dissecting an Excel spreadsheet, trying to figure out where he's going the next day. And this is a guy who was vehemently opposed to, to using us. And we got on the phone and said, just try us. So yeah. that individual and many others ended up again, being our salespeople. So it's like, you know, you look on the sidelines and Brady, you know exactly what this is like. And you got, you're all, it's a tight knit, college coach community mm -hmm. and you're looking at your buddy and if there's game changes on a Friday night and the 50 field changes are at rain and your buddy's drinking a beer and you're crunching over an Excel spreadsheet, you're wondering, well, why aren't you freaking out? Well, cause we use scouting zone. Yeah. And then that person goes, why? Well, I think I better check into scouting zone. Yeah. So kind of like a snowball effect that's happened for us. Just if we can get people to try it, usually it, it sort of speaks for itself. Yeah. Oh yeah. I've, I've, I've seen those, those interactions happening where one coach is working, one coach is just hanging out like, well, they're doing something right. I need to, 
Yeah. Need to get and on that's that. What we want for you guys. We want you to do like go out and recruit. Like that is your job. Your job is not to manipulate spreadsheets for 10 hours a day, right? I mean, that's part mm-hmm. of it. But if we could make that easier for you, then that gives you more time for your family um, and to actually just really hone in on who you're recruiting. Let's take a quick break to talk about bookshop.org. For my fellow bookworms out there, this is something that needs to be on your radar. Using bookshop.org is the best way to support local bookstores. You can keep the ease of shopping online and rest assured that your money is going to the suppliers that deserve it. I think we're well past the point of continuing to give our hard-earned money to a certain monopolistic online retailer. By design, Bookshop donates over 75% of their profit margin to stores, publications, authors, and others who make up the thriving, inspirational culture around books. The great people over at Bookshop even went one further. If you already know of an independent bookstore near you, simply use the interactive map and find that bookstore, and they'll receive the full profit off your order. Using Bookshop can help strengthen the fragile ecosystem around book selling and keep local bookstores an integral part of our culture and communities. Bookshop is a corporation dedicated to the public good. So, next time you need a new book for a cozy day by the fire, or you want a page turner for a day at the beach, visit bookshop.org. You can even search for Footy Friends Team to find books recommended by my guest on the podcast. Happy reading. Yeah, the landscape of soccer, and yeah, I'm wondering if you agree with me or not, is really what I've seen. I mean, it's been change after change from birth year changes where we were going from the school year to the birth year was one year. Yep. Then the EA entered the system and tried to create a powerhouse league that didn't succeed. And then they folded. And then like, so year after year, there's been some sort of massive change. But what I'm noticing is where families used to try to find the right club to put their player in the best position or right team, they're mm-hmm. also now taking it a step further and saying, what league does that club fall under? Um, yeah. And shaking your head, like, it seems a lot to me like, the big leagues are running the most popular showcases and, and I not at all that the independently run club events aren't still important and aren't still popular, but they're having to start to think outside of the box about how the, where surf and Jeff cup and Dallas cup spoke for themselves. They're now really having to try to think about how they're going to compete with the big leagues out there that are drawing the masses. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's one of the biggest shifts that I think that I've seen in a very short amount of time. Yeah, that's a really good point. And you could see, you know, when there were certain leagues leagues folding like the DA and there was almost a vacuum of like, okay, where are all these teams going to go? And you could see clubs aligning with different leagues. Um, So I'm sure like on the family level, those players and families need to make a decision. Like where are they going to be? seen by the most colleges if if that's their goal sure um so but it sounds like scouting zone is is now partnering with just the leagues right yeah so yeah we partner with um all of usu soccer we partner Mm -hmm. with all of us club soccer um we're working on a variety of other partnerships and then we still do you know i would say 90 percent of the major club related events across the country um, you know, we did have the DA until they folded, but now mm-hmm. you're seeing MLS next has now come up on the boys side. And then it seems like they've sort of replaced the boys DA as being yes. one of the top tier on the boys side. And then, you know, the girls Academy surfaced, um, which, you know, is going to compete with ECNL on the girls side. So there's a lot of league action, um, that I, that I find interesting where they really kind of come in and swept up the the showcase as being like okay well 
coaches are having to pick if they can only get to six a year or whatever your budget allows. Right. The independent club events are really having to compete with that now. Yeah, that's tough. I, I wonder what the future is for, for those smaller clubs. Yeah. And, and, you know, for those, those club related events, you know, they use those events to, and, and it's still the same on the younger age groups, you know, they charge a fee for the team um, to get into the event. You know, that's largely how they're funding their club is through those events and how they're paying their coaches. So I think you're not seeing so much of a difference on the younger side, but when it comes to like the showcase older age type events, um, there's definitely more competition in that space now than I've ever seen. Yeah. It's interesting. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, speaking of, of fees, I know something that, you know, affects college coaches and, and our programs. We all have different budgets. Um, but what I found was really interesting was your company can adjust what a program pays, you know, depending on what division they are and, and what, budget they have to work with to get their best package that they want to use all the services you provide. Yeah. So for us, it, it's really important that we did the best that we could to level the playing field so that it wasn't just the deep pocket programs that could afford our product. Mm. And the way that we got around, we say by division, but really how we do it is by user. Um, the NCAA will allow us to charge by user. So where a D1 school typically has, you know, an assistant coach, an associate head coach, a head coach, a volunteer yeah. assistant, you know, they've, and then if you go, you kind of work it down the line where the D3, the head coach is doing a lot of the heavy lifting and they might have a little bit of help. Um, so we're able to sort of tier the pricing because there's just, there's a different number of coaches depending on the division, right. typically speaking. Um, but we didn't want this to be something, we wanted everybody to be able to afford it. And then we have a free version too, you know, and that's the same goes for players. So, you know, the idea is to try to make this as affordable as possible with, you know, freemiums, the free versions, and then the upgrade if you so choose. Um, and then have it tiered based on, you know, number of users, but quote unquote division so that really everybody could afford it. And then for like a D3 with the virtual setting, if you could only travel to two events a year, well, now with this video, you could join 15 events in our system, essentially, let's just say. Sure. And watch video for 15 events where you might not have ever gotten to that event before. Well, I guess video is probably better than nothing. And you're still paying yeah. the fee for it doesn't matter how many events you join in our system so yeah it was important to be able to to fit the budgets at, to the best of our ability for everybody yes and you don't see that from from every company at least being willing to accommodate and, and meet you where you are so i thought that was that was interesting yeah and then like i said oh there'll always be a free version because we certainly are never going to pigeonhole you you know but if, if uh event uses us, we're never going to tell a coach, you have to pay us to see player data. That's never going to happen. The data is there for viewing. It's like a player pro profile booklet just online. Sure. And then the same goes for the players. We're never going to pigeonhole them and say, you're playing this event. You've already paid so much money to get there <laughs> with airfare and everything else you're paying. And now you got to pay 20 bucks to have a profile in the scouting zone. Like, no, we don't do any of that. The profile is free. Um, the upgrades are there if you want them, but um, there shouldn't be a barrier to entry on the, on the event level or to be in mm -hmm. our platform um, based off of the amount of money that you have. Love it. Love it. Yeah. And Great. what's crazy to me, and I wonder if you agree, one of the other things I was thinking about going into this interview is like looking back on when I played, like you didn't start competitive so I think you surf was U12 was the first year that you could play competitively until then it was like, you know, double a or whatever rec. Yeah. Whatever it was. My daughter at six year old is, is playing for an ECNL club. She's still, she's not ECNL yet uh -huh. at six years old. She's learning technique and things that I was not even introduced to until six years later 
in my yeah. lifetime. So you're seeing these kids get really good really early. Yes. Yeah. The, the, it's so much more accelerated, the learning process. So it, it, maybe that's to do with the level of coaching is, is probably a little bit better than when we were playing. Um, and it's all kind of trickled down where, yeah, you, you see the six and seven year olds. Now you're like blown away. Yeah, no, they, they, I, when I watched my daughter practice, it blows my mind. And I think to myself, I wasn't learning those moves or, you know, that style of play until, I mean, so much later in life. But then I think what that also creates is a highly competitive environment where all these kids are getting so good, so young. Um, I just think the, the competition to get to the next level and to play on, you know, the team that you want to play for is much harder now than maybe back when you and I played. Um, yeah. It, when I played, you could show up to a decent showcase and probably be found by a college coach and get some sort of a scholarship uh, just by playing for the name San Diego Surf. Sure. That's really not the case anymore There's, because everybody's so good. You know, there's so yeah. many good players. And, you know, how does a player stand, even if they're as good as anybody else, like, what is the likelihood that you, Brady, are going to walk out into the field and find them in the hundreds of thousands of kids vying for the position at your program? You know, and that's what where the education comes in is if you really want to stand out, like, don't expect to show up on the fields because you play for a good club or you're playing in a good event. Mm -hmm. You're going to be discovered. Like, there's some work that you're going to have to put into that to grab the attention. So yeah. that's a difference too that I've noticed just historically speaking in my timeline of soccer, um, that it's, it's highly competitive and you really have to kind of work at it and put in the work if you, and be intentional about the process. If you want to get to a specific school, you're going to yep. have to put a little work into it. Oh yeah. Big time. Um, yeah. yeah. And I'm sure your soccer background probably helps you empathize with some of these players who are using scouting zone, but I'm sure you have to learn and adjust as the game's changing too. Um, where yes, we, you didn't have this service when you were in your recruiting process, but it's almost like you need to have it now. Yeah. Uh, because you, you help bridge the gap between a player who's just aimlessly walking around, hoping to get seen. Right. But now you can actually, you know, target your interest to schools that are interested in you. Yeah. I, that, that's our hope, you know, because I, I loved playing college soccer. We're so passionate about the sport. It was the best time of my life. I'm still today, 20 years later on a text thread with 20 of my former teammates. Yes. And we text every day, you know, it's, and I just think there's something so cool about being a collegiate athlete. It's like a badge of honor we get to wear and kind of carry for the rest of our lives. Um, I always tell people, you know, like everything I needed to learn about life, I learned on a field somewhere. Um, and I just think that having that experience and getting to be a, a small part of helping a player get there, like I know in hindsight, like how to work on a team, how to overcome obstacles, like all those things that you take into the real world mm -hmm. when your shelf life of soccer is over, stay with you forever. Um, and so, you know, we really, you know, all companies need to make money, but I, I will say like, we really come from a place of passion, um, just based off of our own experience and wanting to get as many players, the same opportunity that we had. Yes. And then I never coached, coached at the college level. So I depend on you guys to give me the information that I need to produce a good product, but you know most of you guys are not doing this to become millionaires. You're doing it to develop good human beings. Absolutely. And to, to be a part of their life in a way that makes them a better person for it. Um, and so I have so much respect for what you guys do out there on the field. Um, coming from a very similar place of just passion for, for the sport and passion for helping others excel in, in life in general. Like I remember my coaches. I remember the ones that oh, like, yeah. you know, and it's maybe not so much about like the, their ability to teach me the tactical aspect of the sport, but just like overcoming adversity and the way that they helped guide me through hard situations. Like you have a lasting impact as a coach on mm -hmm. these people's lives.
in a way that other people can't. Yeah. Yeah. We, we wear a lot of different hats. You know, you can be an educator, you can be a friend, you could be a father figure, mother figure, you know, or all the above. So it's, yeah, it's, it's kind of crazy. The, the impact we can have on specifically like 18 to 22 year old student athletes. That's a right? really important time of Huge. a person's life. It really is. It, they're out of the house for the first time. And it, essentially like you become the quasi parent role. They're leaving their parents. They're still looking for guidance. They're like old enough where they're like tr- you're figuring out life, but like they still need that guidance. So it really is a critical pivotal age. And then, the, you know, when they leave you, they truly are, they need to find a job. They need to apply for a job. So you're teeing them up for success as a college coach for the rest of their lives. That's a big responsibility, Brady. <laughs> hey, <laughs> we, yeah, we, we're doing our best. We're doing our best work here. Oh, you're doing a great job. No, I know, but I just think it's amazing what you guys do. Yeah. And hopefully the pandemic, I mean, I, I'm hoping that through Scouting Zone and platforms that you've felt like you've been able to continue the process. I'm assuming you feel like it's very digitized and needing the, the footage from these players and needing emails. I mean, how else are you going to recruit? I mean, yeah, the, the recruiting process doesn't stop really ever. No. Um, so it was, uh, it served the players that, that transitioned to the digital side quicker, who were able to get their, their emails looking nice and professional and like professional looking highlight tapes together. Uh, when the pandemic hit because all the events were, you know, were postponed or canceled. So there weren't, there wasn't much live soccer to see. Um, but again, those student athletes who were prepared and able to adjust kind of shot right up to the top of the list. Absolutely. Yep. A good lesson in adaptability and facing adversity right early on. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. My heart does break though a little bit for these seniors and juniors in high school, not that hope is lost, but just that this was just such an unforeseen um, situation that nobody could have predicted where they've worked so hard for so long. I'm also a college director for, um, for the sharks in Del Mar. Okay. Like, I work with these players, you know, and they're asking me, what do I do? And my suggestion is exactly what you and I just talked about. Like get jump to the top of their radars by being proactive. Don't sit back just because you're not playing. Yes. Like they're still recruiting. So yeah. take advantage of the opportunity and set yourself apart from the other players who have just completely stopped in the process. Cause they mm-hmm. feel like there's nothing I can do. Um, when in reality, that's not the case. So no. I feel good about being able to relay that message and hopefully helping the hand, you know, our database of players that are hopefully opening our emails. And then the kids I get to work with one-on-one um, to kind of get them out of that space of hopelessness to like, wait, there's still is definitely an opportunity recruiting is still going. I just have to adjust to the new environment. Yeah. And soccer is going to come back eventually, right? It might, it might not be tomorrow, but it's going to come back. And yeah, if, if you were doing your work and making impressions in that downtime, then you're, it's going to serve you well when it, when normalcy does return. I could have used you on my college talk that I did for the Sharks last uh, Saturday. I'll, That's exactly I'll, I'll Zoom doing. bomb the next one. All right. Perfect. <laughs> because of that, I, I'm glad that I heard that from you because that was exactly what I was telling them. Like, look, guys, you can sky, like the, the, the playing field has been leveled. Like yeah. you're both these better off than the other. Like it's the ones that are being proactive that are going to shoot to the top. And maybe get the first looks when this does pick up. And like you said, it will. It will. Yeah. We hope it's soon, but it's coming. Fingers crossed. Yeah. 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 Well, uh, when's your six-year-old getting a scouting zone profile? (laughs) Hopefully not for a while. I'm not ready for that yet. No. I just did the, the, the sharks talk and they opened it up to seventh and eighth graders. And I was really astounded by the number of, uh, really? 14 year olds that were online and they asked me how early do you start and I said look you know in the eighth grade you're not going to be recruited they can't even talk to you until after you know your sophomore year June 15th of your sophomore year but hey if you want to get on their radar fast and early and educate yourself Mm -hmm. 
why not? You know, there's no harm in understanding the process as an eighth grader. Just know that you're not going to be that at that age. Right. So that was my message to them. But there are quite a few of them on there. So, wow. I, but you know, I'm glad that the NCAA got a hold of of that to some extent. Where I was watching seventh graders verbally commit to different schools, specifically on the girls' side. Yes. And I just, and then the next school next to them felt like they had to compete in the same way and they were going after the seventh graders. And I just thought, I don't think these kids are, this is a decision, a lifetime decision that you're asking yeah. them to get 12 at 13 years old. It was wildly out of control. Yeah. So I'm pretty happy that the NCAA enforced the rule that, you know, the no communication type rule until at least after their sophomore year. Mm-hmm. So yeah. Let's keep my daughter out of the system. <laughs> <laughs> I know that that's I want her crazy. to enjoy the sport. And you know, this my oldest daughter plays volleyball, and it's as competitive as soccer down here in Southern California. Oh yeah. Uh, and so, you know, she's twelve, and she's. I mean, I just watching the ages tick off, and I'm like, oh gosh, you know, this is going to happen sooner rather than later, whether I like it or not. But, you know, I think it's important at the younger ages just to facilitate a love for the game and not burn them out too quickly um, with things like recruitment and playing in college. And, you know, they're already so committed, so young. Um, So I commend all those coaches of the younger kids that really not only are they teaching the right fundamentals of the game, but just like to the love of it and the teammates and the camaraderie. That's really what it's about. Mm -hmm specifically at the, and, and that doesn't change, but really at those younger ages, you facilitate the love. And so it's fun to watch my daughter just truly love soccer and enjoy it. Yes. Um, and that's how I want to keep it for her for, for as long as we can. Right. Oh yeah. Keep it going. Yeah. Keep it going for sure. Nice. Yeah. Well, with, you know, I want to thank you so much for thinking of me and for having me. And I think what you're doing is awesome. And, you know, keep up the good work and we'd love to help you in any way we can uh, just draw attention to what I think is going to be a great success for you. You're doing awesome work too. So I'd love to continue to connect. All right. Well, thank you so much. Love it. All righty. Have a good one. Big love. Peace.